So thanks everyone for tuning in. And you know, in this time and era that we live in, obviously we want to keep some social distancing and wearing masks. Obviously I have my mask right here, but since there's plenty of space between me and the presenter and our presentation technician, we are practicing good safety standards. So I hope everyone at home is doing the same. Tonight's discussion is on the latest treatment for heart valve problems, emerging structural heart procedures. So once again, my name is Srini Iyengar. I'm the Director of Structural Heart at Boulder Heart and Boulder Community Health. And with that, I'd like to go forward with our background. So historically, a number of cardiac conditions could only be treated with open heart surgery. Given the increasing age of our population, in addition to the multiple comorbid issues involved, the risk of complications of operating on this population has also gone up. Basically, people are getting older, living longer, and like to live healthier. A number of times we've seen patients who are going in their eighth, ninth decade of life who aren't good candidates for open heart surgery, but still have the ability to have quality of life. Oftentimes in these situations, we need to have other tools other than just saying, well, it's open heart surgery or nothing. And in this kind of vacuum in the last 20 years, we've seen technology move forward in leaps and bounds, and some of those things we'll be discussing tonight. So let's give you a little background of the endovascular or minimally invasive procedures that have been occurring in medicine. 30 years ago, we used coronary balloons, which is called PTCA, initially for patients who had blocked coronary arteries. I know that sounds like, well, we use that all the time, but there was a time where we only used blood thinners. Literally, if you were having a large heart attack, when you came to the emergency room, you would receive a blood thinner through your IV, which did work, but not necessarily as well as what we have now, which is stents and balloons for heart attacks. Pacemakers. Historically, pacemakers used to be implanted by surgeons during open heart procedures. Now, the pacemakers themselves, which used to be literally seven, eight inches wide and maybe three, four inches thick, have gone to a fraction of that size, and they can be implanted without open heart surgery. But the one major area that was not successfully addressed was structural heart which basically means the valves of the heart, the left atrial appendage. So what we saw in the last 10 years is a major change in this direction. We like to call this a structural heart revolution, not just evolution. Why do we say that? Because now we have the capability to address serious internal cardiac issues with minimally invasive techniques. Now the results with certain procedures have now shown to be equivalent, if not better, than certain conditions than the surgical standard of care. So what I'm saying is that we have actually gone so far that certain procedures, like the TAVR procedure, which I'll be talking about shortly, for aortic stenosis, have actually surpassed the qualifications for open surgical valve replacement. So this movement only seems to be gaining strength with newer technologies entering the arena every year. Given the amount of time we have tonight, I'm going to focus our discussion on two specific heart valve issues. The first one is called mitral regurgitation. The heart has four valves, the mitral valve, the pulmonic valve, the tricuspid valve, and the aortic valve. The mitral valve, to just explain basically, is the valve that connects the left atrium to the left ventricle. So it's a left-sided valve. When this valve isn't functioning properly or is leaking, we call it regurgitation. So what does mitral regurgitation do to Americans? Well, it affects thousands of Americans every year. It's vastly undertreated, and it basically means the mitral valve has become leaky, that blood spills backwards into the lungs rather than going forward into the left ventricle as a result of a weak or degenerated mitral leaflet. This results in progressive shortness of breath, fatigue, and eventual heart failure. So what causes 
something like mitral regurgitation. What causes the valves to become leaky? So there's something called degenerative MR, known as primary or organic MR, which is due to an anatomic abnormality of the mitral valve itself, including the leaflets and or the subvalvular apparatus, such as the chordae or papillary muscles. Basically, the valve is tethered to the heart by, those, by cords. And those cords, if they get weak or tear, can result in the regurgitant of the valve. There's also a functional MR, also known as secondary MR, as a result of left ventricular dilatation. So if the left ventricle becomes dilated and gets wider, it'll pull the mitral valve apart, causing that leak. This could be secondary to ischemic heart disease, which basically means if you've had multiple heart attacks or blocked arteries, this can cause that to happen. Left ventricular dysfunction can lead to annular dilatation and incomplete coaptation of the mitral valve resulting in MR. So the main thing is, again, if you're looking at this slide from home, you could see from left to right, you have the normal mitral valve. The next slide shows you the degenerative MR, where the leaflets are not really getting together, but there's something wrong underneath with them. The third is the flail valve, where the valves are not touching whatsoever, and you have severe MR. And the last one is a functional MR where you can see the leaflets are being pulled apart most likely because of the dilated left ventricle. Moderate or severe valvular disease is common and increases with age. Mitral regurgitation is the most common type of heart valve insufficiency in the US. The prevalence increases with age, going from 0.5% in 18 to 44 year olds, rising to nearly 10% for people over 75 years old. So naturally, this is something that when we identify it, we wanna keep a close eye on it. I'm not saying that just because you have a little bit of leaking valve, you need surgery. I'm saying if there is some leaking, we should take a closer look, make sure there's no other reasons that we can adjust like hypertension or high blood pressure that might be contributing to that leaky valve. This is the reason why on this slide, if you have mitral regurgitation, and it starts to progress, it will eventually lead to heart failure. It's the vicious cycle of prog basically progressing mitral regurgitation. MR, which is mitral regurgitation, initiates a cascade of events progressing to heart failure than death if untreated. If you look at this spiral, or this circle, look at the top at 12 o'clock where it says increasing mitral regurgitation. What that does is the leaky valve then puts more stress on your left ventricle, which can't pump blood out of the heart, but instead is pumping backwards. So it increases load stress. Load stress makes your muscle dilate over time. And this is not an overnight thing, not even over a few months. This is usually over years, if it is chronic. If it's acute, it's a different situation. But the load stress that does increase over time results in muscle damage and loss which eventually leads to dysfunction of your left ventricle, then dilates your left ventricle, and then it again, when you dilate your left ventricle, like I just mentioned on the prior slide, it leads to more dilatation of your mitral valve, which leads to increasing mitral regurgitation. So it's a vicious cycle, and we like to get involved quicker or earlier in the process to see if we can stop it from getting to the dysfunction of the left ventricle. So treatment. Historically, only medical therapy followed by surgery, if possible, were mainstays of treatment. If someone has mitral regurgitation and then high blood pressure, we treat the high blood pressure. If someone has mitral regurgitation and normal blood pressure, we give them water pills oftentimes to kind of reduce the amount of volume in their body to reduce the shortness of breath. The problem is if the valve itself is diseased or degenerative, medical therapy is very limited. So surgery, is the gold standard and still is. However, surgery can be high risk in certain patients of this population. It needs to be done by a surgeon with the skill experience to perform a mitral valve replacement repair. I'm pleased to say that I work with two phenomenal surgeons at Boulder Heart, Dr. Brian Mahan and Dr. Dan O'Hare, both of which have probably over a thousand mitral valve procedures under their belt from the robotic to traditional sternotomies or open surgery, repairs to replacements. So we have capable surgeons who can do this type of work. However, I've not just worked at Boulder. 
I've worked at other centers, and I've seen other surgeons, and I've seen other doctors in different parts of the country. And I will tell you, operating on the mitral valve is a, is a very high skill set. Not all surgeons are created equal, and not all surgeons can perform complex mitral valve repair work like the surgeons that we work with currently here at Boulder Heart. But that being said, there are patients that are even too sick, too frail, too old potentially, who have too many comorbid issues that even the most skilled surgeons would say, we probably shouldn't operate. Those are the patients that need therapy, but if surgery, which is the gold standard, is not suitable for them, what can we do? So into this void came the MitroClip system. The MitroClip was a first-in-class leading technology and is still the only FDA-approved product in the United States for MitroClip repair percutaneously. It's a percutaneous mitral valve repair by creating a vertical line of coaptation. Basically, what we're doing is putting a clip across a valve, forming a double orifice valve. We perform it on a beating heart, no cardiopulmonary bypass, real-time positioning. It's designed to preserve surgical options, so if we put the clip, that does not mean you can't get a valve replacement at a later time. It's done through a, the groin access or a vein through the leg, and usually people stay in the hospital for 24 hours. That's usually the length of stay. And we've seen a tremendous successful outcomes for patients who get MitraClip who are appropriate candidates. We're seeing that their lower hospital length of stay compared to open heart surgery or compared to TAVR, and 87% of MitraClip patients are discharged at home. And there's a 73% reduction in hospitalizations for heart failure with these patients. So I'm sure you're probably thinking, well, if it's so good, why are we doing surgery? Well, the truth is, it's very good, but surgery, I will tell you, in the right hands is still the best therapy for patients with severe MR. MitraClip fills that space for patients who cannot get surgery or are very high risk for open heart surgery. So in the paradigm of how we treat patients who have mitral regurgitation who need to have their valve fixed, oftentimes the lower risk patients, the younger patients, a robot mitral valve repair with Dr. O'Hare would be perfect. The patients that are medium level risk or a little bit higher risk, open heart surgery with either of our surgeons would be perfect. Now, if you're a patient though, that would be, say, have some major comorbid issues, your lung disease, kidney disease, prior open heart surgery. This is where the mitral clip has a place. And with that, I'd like to show you what exactly the clip does. So here's an image of the beating heart with the veins and the arteries attached to the heart. And it's here in the diagram showing you the different portions of the heart. This diagram shows blood flowing into the left atrium, into the left ventricle, and then it goes out the aorta. We're now focusing on the mitral valve, which is right there in the middle of the screen. Again, blood coming into the atrium, going down the valve, into the ventricle, and out the aorta. A normally functioning valve will open and close, open and close. There will not be any changes in exactly how it opens or closes. In this situation though, what we're seeing there, that little jet, that's called mitral regurgitation. That's from a valve that's not closing properly. Here, we're showing you the differences between the degenerative and functional MR, basically telling you that either condition can cause a leaky valve. This microscopic examination is showing you how the, the muscle fibers are being stretched and degenerated and turned into dead cells by over time of 
the regurgitation. So this is the mitral clip. It's not this big. Trust me, it's a lot smaller. This is just for size to show you up close. When I first started doing these procedures, the first mitral clip procedure I think I was in, it was in 2007. It felt like we were on the deck of the uh, Enterprise looking at some of the equipment that they had. And it's amazing that this equipment has been devised so specifically just for the mitral, the mitral valve. And we have a little bit of freezing here. Let's see if I can, looks like our video is frozen. So I'll go play that again so we can see. And let's see if it moves forward this time. Well, it looks like it's moving at this point. Let's see, this was our stop point before and it stopped again. I can move forward with the other sure. topic, or would you like to adjust this so we can continue with this slide? It'd be important to show, I think everyone who's watching would like to know what the mitral clip was actually. Okay, good, perfect right there, good. All right, folks, sorry for that little technical interruption. So what we have now, we have the catheter crossing from the right to the left atrium. Once that's performed, we then pass a sheath across the atrium. You will, patients do not feel this, and this hole that we make actually closes up usually at about a one month period. Here we are delivering our mitral clip actually into the atrium and then we torque it to face the valve itself. We open it up and we're facing the mitral valve from a different angle and we can see that under echocardiographic guidance. We then pass the clip under the leaflets and if we're happy with our position, we'll pull back and try to catch the leaflets into the clip itself. We then clasp the clip down and reassess how we like the clip, it's how we like the mitral regurgitation at this point. Is it sufficiently reduced with what we've done? If we don't like where we've placed the clip, we'll open it up, move the clip again, and regrasp. Once we've done this, we'll reassess the mitral regurgitation. If we're happy, we'll go ahead and release the clip. And our goal is for significant reduction of that mitral regurgitation after the clip is deployed. With that being said, I'll move on to our second part of our discussion tonight. Aortic stenosis. So from a leaky mitral valve, we're going to discuss now a calcified or tight aortic valve. The aortic valve is the valve that connects basically the aorta or the heart to the aorta. It's a large valve, and this valve, when it becomes calcified, prevents blood from coming out of the heart to the aorta. Aortic stenosis can be seen earlier in life as a congenital issue called a bicuspid valve, but we often, more often see it as a calcific age-related issue. Calcific aortic stenosis is a very real problem in the U.S., but more so in the Florida population. I write that because I spent eight years in Florida and I saw a lot of patients with aortic stenosis. Results in closure of the aortic valve, which causes progressive angina, which is chest pain, 
syncope, which is basically passing out, and lightheadedness can eventually lead to heart failure and death. So if we look at the prevalence of aortic stenosis, aortic stenosis is estimated to be prevalent up to 7% of the population over the age of 65. It is more likely to affect men than women, and 80% of adults with symptomatic aortic stenosis are male. So let's look at the demographics. Aortic stenosis affects about 2% of the population over 65 years old. Aortic sclerosis, which means that there's scarring of the valve, but not yet tightening or closing of it, affects nearly 30% of the U.S. population over 65. And aortic sclerosis and myocardial infarction affects 50%, and there's a greater risk of mortality and, and infarction with this. So I would often say that if you have aortic sclerosis, even though your valve isn't tight or calcified, it's worth watching to make sure it doesn't progress. So what causes aortic stenosis in adults? Well, the most common, as I mentioned earlier, is age-related calcific aortic stenosis. It's usually caused by calcium deposits associated with aging. It's important that I repeat that, associated with aging with calcium, not dietary. I have a lot of patients that swear off all dairy products and calcium because of this condition. And I tell them, take your medication for osteoporosis, take your dairy if you'd like, but the truth is it is nothing to do with your dietary calcium intake that affects the calcium on the aortic valve. Rheumatic fever. Adults who have had rheumatic fever as a child may be risk of aortic stenosis later in life. And as we discussed, congenital abnormalities like the bicuspid aortic valve which is two leaflets, not three, that patients are born with. So major risk factors, increasing age, male gender, high blood pressure, smoking, elevated LPA and LDL cholesterol. So these risk factors, honestly, are risk factors for all types of cardiovascular disease. So I never look at these specifically and say this will lead to AS. It's just what we have found to be associated with the condition. Aortic stenosis is life-threatening and progresses rapidly after symptoms develop. This is a very important slide. Patients will oftentimes say, I feel fine, and yet they have a valve that's not opening well at all, that clinically, or excuse me, by echocardiography looks extremely tight, but the patients are saying, I feel fine, I have no symptoms. And we do watch a number of these patients. But if you can see that blue slide on the right, once symptoms develop, then it's a rapid decline. So it's not about catching patients when they have chest pain or heart failure or where they're passing out. We oftentimes say if you have severely calcified aortic valve and you start noticing increasing fatigue, lethargy, shortness of breath with day-to-day -day activities, well, then we may need to strike because we only have a certain amount of time before that then rapidly develops into one of those conditions where mortality goes realistically through the roof. It's a sobering perspective, though, about aortic stenosis, the five-year survival. If you have severe inoperable aortic stenosis, your survival is much worse than a number of common cancers, breast cancer, lung cancer, colorectal, why is that? Because a number of patients historically, when they presented with severe inoperable aortic stenosis, were too high risk for many surgeons to take on. So we really didn't have an option for a lot of these patients. Medications for aortic stenosis is not good. It doesn't take away a calcified valve. We can give water pills to patients to make them feel better, but it doesn't change the underlying pathology of a heavily calcified valve. So when we do operate earlier in the process, aortic valve replacement greatly improves survival. Study data demonstrates that early and late outcomes were similarly good in both symptomatic and asymptomatic patients. And it's important to note that among asymptomatic patients with severe aortic stenosis, omission of surgical treatment was the most important risk factor for late mortality. So not only do we wanna catch patients early in the symptomatic process, we want to offer them a valve replacement because that's really what makes a difference. However, there's a low percentage of aortic valve surge 
surgery done naturally. And a lot of times this is not because of the surgeon's fault, but rather the patients are denying symptoms, say they don't have symptoms until they present late and then they're too high risk for surgery. Studies have shown 40% of patients with severe AS are not treated with a aortic valve replacement. And why is that? Because, again, their surgical risk was very high and most surgeons historically were feeling that they were too risky to put on the table. Well, because of this, something had to be done. We couldn't just offer patients medications that didn't really do much. A lot of these patients couldn't get surgery because they were too high risk. There was a procedure called a balloon valvuloplasty, which we delivered through an artery and put a balloon in the aortic valve and opened it up and then pulled the balloon out. The problem with it, it was so unwieldy. We didn't know how long the balloon results would last. And on it, often there was a lot of complications associated with the procedure. So the balloon valvuloplasty fell by the wayside about 25 years ago because people realized we just couldn't predict accurate results. So what did we do then? Well. Let's talk about the aortic valve replacement again. Open heart surgery, again, becomes riskier with the older population. We need longer hospital stays, rehab, and treatment of comorbid issues. The last 10 years, again, has seen a revolution in this therapy. Into this arena came TAVR. In Europe, it's called TAVI. What it means is transcatheter aortic valve replacement, or in Europe, transcatheter aortic valve implantation. TAVR has become a viable technology for the treatment of aortic stenosis. And just today, there's data being released that for the first time in the history of medicine in this country, there are more TAVR procedures being done for aortic stenosis than open surgical procedures for aortic stenosis. It's the first time we've ever seen it. This technology has now come up, matched, and now passed the gold standard that historically was open or aortic valve surgery. So what is TAVR? TAVR is an aortic valve replacement as an alternative to traditional open heart surgery. It's less invasive for patients that are too high risk for traditional surgery. This is an older slide because now TAVR is indicated for high risk patients, intermediate risk patients, and low risk patients. There are two TAVR options, the Edwards Sapien valve and the Medtronic core valve, which is a nitinol frame self-expanding. One, the Edwards is a balloon expandable valve. The Medtronic valve is self-expanding. One uses a cow valve, one uses a pig valve. I often tell patients, you know, it's not like you're gonna go oink or moo after these uh, procedures, but nonetheless, they do use separate animal valves. There was a third valve from Boston Scientific that just got taken off the market uh, yesterday because of, again, it just wasn't feasible for this type of patient population. This shows you that not every valve can be utilized in this space. These two valves, the Edwards and the Medtronic valves, have been the most thoroughly investigated valves in the world for TAVR, and hence why they're the current options, and they're the two valves that we currently utilize at Boulder Community Health. But out of the two, I'd like to comment on the Medtronic core valve. And the reason why is because now we're seeing that when you place a valve in a, place, a patient, a TAVR valve, it's not just about replacing the old aortic calcified valve. You want to place a new valve that's equal or greater in size. And this Medtronic core valve, which is self-expanding, gives us that ability. And hence, we've had excellent results utilizing this valve in our patient population. Recent studies with this valve have showed better results in high-risk patients receiving this core valve as opposed to open-heart surgery. So the real question now is not if you can get a TAVR versus open-heart surgery, but we have to ask ourselves, what's the durability of these valves? All bioprosthetic valves, surgical and non-surgical, have a life of 10 to 15 years. I've seen them last as low as three years and last as long as 20. The TAVR valve is now that type of situation where we are asking ourselves, what's the long-term durability? Luckily, we found out through thousands of patients, the larger the valve you put in, the longer the lifespan is what we've seen in the valve. So we are actually quite happy that we are implanting as large of a valve as possible because we know eventually all bioprosthetic valves do tend to degenerate. But we know that if we can give patients 10, 15 years with a TAVR valve, and we know by the way technology is going, 
that we may potentially be able to put another tavern in a tavern in the future? Well, that's something to be look, that's something worth looking forward to. And now TAVR is approved in low risk, intermediate, and high risk patients. So the summary is heart valve disease is growing in the US population. We need alternatives to standard surgical therapy for patients who are higher risk for complications. And both TAVR and MitraClip represent the forefront of these therapies, but they certainly will not be the last. But before we conclude, I'm going to go ahead and show you the deployment video of the TAVR valve as long as our internet and everything is functioning. So let's see here and So here we have the beating heart once again. And again, if you can remember from the last video, we're looking at the severe aortic stenosis. I'm going to show you on top there. This valve right now, the, see how it's kind of changing in front of your eyes? It's getting more calcified. That's the aortic valve that's not opening well. So what happens during these tablet procedures? We do not utilize general anesthesia in the vast majority of the procedures. It takes about one to two hours to do it, and patients typically stay in the hospital for 24 hours. There's a femoral artery in the leg, which would be, it's more or less our conduit to the heart. So by entering the artery with the catheter, we then advance the valve over a wire, which is already into the heart. So we're going up the aorta. We then place the valve across the old aortic valve, and we literally unfurl the valve. And we can actually reposition it multiple times as well. And here, right then and there, the new valve is working under pressure. So there's no need for sutures. There's no need for epoxy or any type of adhesive. The valve is in place and working immediately. At that point, we remove the catheter and close the groin. And again, patients are usually off bed rest in three to four hours and home within a day. So with that being said, I'd like to say thank you and open to questions. Thank you, Dr. Iyengar. We do have one question already. What is the durability of the mitral valve surgery and clips? The dura so the question is, what's the durability of mitral valve surgery and is it and clips or just the mitral? And clips. So the mitral valve surgery is excellent surgery. And honestly, the durability is we've seen patients out 10, 20 years from a repair with no issues. A replacement, theoretically, if you have a replaced valve, it's just like a replaced bioprosthetic aortic valve. So about 10 to 15 years is what we're hoping for with those valves. The mitral clip is honestly... So I've yet to see it ever not function the way it's supposed to because, again, it's a very small device compared to putting a large valve in. And the durability, to this day, I've yet to see a mitral clip fail, per se, as in, you know, not working the way it should be. Have we placed more than one mitral clip in a patient before? We have because sometimes patients have large valves with multiple leaks and you would require more than one mitral clip. Okay. Great. We have another question here. Um, I have a heart valve issue. Is there anything I can do besides exercise and fish oil? So the question is, if I have a heart valve issue, what can I do other than dietary and exercise? Well, I'm going to tell you, it depends on what the heart valve issue is. Now, heart valves are more mechanical than coronary disease or peripheral vascular disease. We tell patients who have peripheral vascular disease to exercise, to get more blood flow, and coronary disease, once we know the blockages have been addressed, we tell them to exercise more. People with underlying valve disease, exercise does not change the pathology necessarily of these valves. 
if you have a tight valve like mitral stenosis or aortic stenosis, exercise potentially can even bring out symptoms quicker and make you feel worse. So oftentimes I tell patients if they have anything under the umbrella of valvular heart disease, number one, see your cardiologist, and number two, get an echocardiogram, an ultrasound of the heart, so we can really figure out what valve is the problem. Great, thank you. And here is another one. Is there a genetic component? component? I have severe heart disease in my family. Yes, so the question is, is there a genetic predisposition to certain heart disease? Of course. I'll tell you in Boulder especially, I can't tell you how many patients come in who are in denial that they have heart disease. And the reason is because they are vegan, they run up uh, Mount Sinitas every day, they're feeling fantastic, and then when I tell them they have triple vessel heart disease, you would think that they just lost everything they've ever worked for. And actually, I tell these patients, you've actually done everything right. Because you were so healthy is why most likely your heart wasn't damaged and why you've avoided being in the ER. The truth is, you can pick your friends, but you can't pick your relatives. Mm -hmm. So the, the thing is, if your father, mother, brother, sister, uncles had heart disease, even if you did everything right, it's still no way to avoid the potential that it's there in your underlying milieu, in your bloodstream, in your genetics. So that goes with valve disease as well. If you have a bicuspid aortic valve, there is a good potential that you may have it in your family as well. So my suggestion is if you have a very strong family history of heart disease, whether it be coronary or valvular, and there is any symptomatology on your end, get checked out. Great, thank you so much. What is the pacemaker rate for core valve, and how does that compare to surgery and Sapien 3? So the question is, what's the pacemaker rate for a core valve versus surgery and for Sapien? This is a moving target question, because historically, when we started doing TAVR years ago, core valve was actually higher pacemaker rate than Sapien, because the implantation of the core valve was oftentimes deeper into the LVOT or the track that leads to the aortic valve than the sapien. Well, in the last five years, things have dramatically changed as operators who perform these procedures do it more often and get better at it. At Boulder, we have less than a 2% pacemaker rate for our valves. And the reasoning is not because the valves themselves are better, but it's because we've done so many that we actually have a better idea of how to implant them and prevent the pacemaker rates. The sapien valve is implanted the same way as historically the other sapien valves has, but it also comes to say that if you plant a sapien valve in a patient who has a normal conduction system, the pacemaker rates are gonna be less than 3%. If you, however, put a uh, TAVR in a patient who has something called a left bundle branch block, or a first degree block with a fascicular block. These are all terms we use in EKG reading. The likelihood of getting a permanent pacemaker goes up. And in surgery, depending on what type of surgery is performed, if it's a bypass surgery, the likelihood of a pacemaker is extremely low. If it's a bypass surgery plus a valve or two valves or just one valve, it all varies on the type of surgery the pacemaker rate that may be used. And then it depends on what the patient's electrical rhythm was before the procedure, because that really does determine oftentimes if the patient will have a predisposition to getting a permanent pacemaker. Great, thank you. Uh, next question is, um, I have a severe aortic regurgitation. Is there any news about surgery for that? So the question is severe aortic regurgitation, so not stenosis, a leaky aortic valve. So that valve, or the, the aortic regurgitant valve, is a valve that is being hotly researched right now. There is potentially, in the next two to three years, a dedicated TAVR valve for patients with aortic regurgitation. The current generation of TAVR valves are not indicated for leaky aortic valves. And why, you may ask? because the pathologies are different. When you have aortic stenosis, you have calcium deposition on the valves, which act as concrete almost, or as a foundation to hold the TAVR valve in place. When you have a leaky aortic valve, 
there's nothing to hold the valve in place. So when you place a tabber valve in these valves, they tend to move either up or down. Hence why the results with tabber valves and aortic regurgitation have not been good. And that's why we need to have a dedicated valve for this type of pathology. As for surgery, it's still the gold standard for aortic regurgitation. Great, thank you. What are the general risks for the various options you have discussed? Well, that's a global question. The question is, what are the risks for the minimally invasive procedures? Historically, they used to be all vascular, all about the axis, putting the big catheters through the veins and the arteries of the legs. Well, in the last 10 years, these catheters have shrunk immensely in size. We've gotten a lot better at putting them in. So the vascular complications, which used to be probably 30% of all the complications, is probably less than 1%. The biggest risk of TAVR at this point, as previously mentioned in the question, potentially getting a permanent pacemaker. The biggest risk of stroke that we used to have with TAVR has been mitigated because we now utilize, and Boulder Heart is one of the few centers that do this on every patient. We place a device through the wrist during a TAVR procedure called a Sentinel Cerebral Protection Device, which protects the carotid arteries from plaque that breaks off during a TAVR procedure. So stroke risks have been reduced significantly. I would say during the mitral clip procedure, the same issue applies, that you're putting a catheter through the vein, and though the vein is more compliant than the artery, vascular complications can happen. But overall, the success rates for these procedures are currently probably well over 99% or 98% at least, and the major complications are less than 1%. But you've got to remember, we don't put patients on the table who we haven't thoroughly evaluated. If the patient has high-risk features, we'll find a way to deal with them, whether involving our surgical colleagues to do a cut down of the artery or access different parts of the body. Maybe we want to put the TAVR through the neck arteries versus the groin arteries. But these are all things we work up prior to going to the case. So that's one of the, the main positives of the newer therapies. It's never done on the fly. It's always done after a thorough team evaluation. Great, thank you. Actually, just on, to elaborate on that, you, you did mention the, um, the result of an implantation, um, as a result of the implantation, a, a pacemaker? That was one of the questions. Uh, just, uh, just to make sure, you did say the- I did, uh-huh. Okay, great, thank you. Um, the next question. How long do the materials used in robot-assisted MVR last, the rings and stitches? Well, that's a good question for my partner, Dr. Dan O'Hare. As a non-CT uh, surgeon tonight, as I'm speaking, I can only speak to his skill set in doing it, but I can't give any long-term data about any specifics about the suture material or the replacement material that he utilizes during his robotic procedures. Okay, great. Um, we have another question. If a valve has a stenosis, is there, way of, is there a way of using a balloon to open the stenosis air area? So the question is, is there a balloon procedure there to open the stenosis? a way of using a balloon to open the stenosis area? Right, so earlier in my discussion, in my talk tonight, I mentioned the balloon aortic valvuloplasty procedure, which was in the 1980s thought to be revolutionary. We would put a balloon in the aortic valve inflate the balloon temporarily for a few seconds and then deflate it and open the valve. And the reason why we thought that would work is because in mitral stenosis patients, uh, oftentimes that children really and you know, teenagers, we could put a balloon in the mitral valve who had rheumatic heart disease and open the valve and get great long-term results. Well, that just shows you that the pathology of mitral stenosis and aortic stenosis are different, especially when rheumatic fever had been involved. Putting a balloon in the aortic valve really resulted in no good long-term results. We really didn't have any long-term durability doing that procedure. And if we were too aggressive, we ended up splitting the valve and having the valve become wide open, leaking, which is, of course, an equally bad problem. So the balloon procedure is something we do only in this day and age to either temporize a patient. If that example, if I have a patient coming to the hospital who has critical AS but has, is bleeding, who needs to have GI surgery, we may do the balloon procedure just to get them through their surgery. Or if there's patients who are palliative care, who are 
really just wanting some quality in the last few months of life, we may do a balloon procedure, but not replace the valve as an end stage procedure, but it is not used as a treatment procedure for patients who can get a valve replacement. Thank you so much. Okay, so the next question. My doctor in Toronto believes my valve problems came from ulnary embolism in the 1970s and a recent embolism in 2019. Can you comment? Well, valvular heart disease can definitely originate from pulmonary issues as well. So if you had lung clots, lung clots make lung pressure usually go up or damage the lung tissue so the heart has to work harder. Oftentimes this results in tricuspid and pulmonic regurgitation, which are the right-sided heart valves going to the lungs. So if the lung pressures get up, they actually push back on those two valves. So oftentimes we will see that happen. But that has to be pretty severe lung clots to cause some severe lung damage for that to happen. Because we have plenty of patients who have pulmonary emboli who recover without any valvular heart problems. So these may be from situations, or this situation may be from a severe lung dysfunction that's causing these valve issues. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. The next question. Is this treatment expensive? Having just moved from Ontario, Canada, I am concerned about expenses. I do have Medicare. Well, I think the last statement of that question is the most important. Medicare does cover both Taver and MitraClip 100%. It is incredibly important, though, to actually state that because oftentimes patients will say, I, there's no way I'm going to go through this if this costs anything out of pocket. Luckily, these are not research uh, protocols. These are not experimental. And these are standard of care devices, as in we're utilizing them as part of standard of care. If, however, we were to put a TAVR valve in a leaky aortic valve, that isn't a standard of care procedure. So that's why it's very important to match the right procedure with the right pathology. Next, thank you so much. Um, the next question, um, will stem cells eventually be used to grow our own valves? Well, this is an interesting question. Will stem cells eventually replace what we're doing me mechanistically, putting in devices in the heart? I'll tell you, you know, 13 years ago when I was at Columbia University, you know, stem cells in the heart was a hotly discovered or described issue and people were debating, do we inject what type of stem cells? Do we inject them into the heart directly, into the bloodstream? The truth is the data hasn't borne out. So that was 13 years ago and, and we're still waiting for the amazing stem cell revolution. It is something I hope that will come eventually because I will be honest, it'll be great to see a scarred heart or an ischemic heart be able to regrow, you know, viable myocardium. We haven't gotten there yet, and I think the problem is, is because it starts at the basic science level. What type of stem cells are you gonna use? How are you gonna introduce it to the body? And how is the heart itself going to utilize those cells specifically? Like how do we know the stem cells don't go to some other part of the body and utilize it there? So we are really in the, in the dark zone, or in the dark ages when it comes to stem cell therapy currently. So there's nothing really on the horizon, FDA-wise, to utilize stem cells at this point. Thank you so much. All right, we're just gonna find the next question here. Okay. Are there any different outcomes for TAVR in case of bicuspid valve? So the question is, is there any different in outcomes with TAVR in bicuspid valves? Historically with TAVR, bicuspid pa patients were excluded from all the clinical trials because the pathology of a bicuspid valve was different. What we found was the origination or the original iteration of TAVR valves weren't very good for patients with true bicuspid valves because the bicuspid valve can be at a different, the ovaloid shape, not circular, and the valves themselves can be more bulkier. But in the last two to three years, we've found now with the newer generation of TAVR valves, especially the larger core valves, that they actually do quite well in the bicuspid valves. And the FDA has recently removed their, their warning or contraindication for TAVR valves, the core valve, 
to be utilized in bicuspid valves. So we routinely repair bicuspid valves utilizing the core valve, self-expanding valve at this time. Great. Dr. Iyengar, I'm just going to give the chat a second to catch up and see if there's going to be any more questions come in, and then we can move, move on. Okay, Dr. Iyengar, um, the next question I have for you is, um, have you seen any COVID-related problems in people who have TAVR? So the question is, have we seen any COVID-related problems in patients who have received TAVR, and I'll even go as far as who have received MitraClip? So patients who undergo these procedures, we have not seen any device-related infection, especially COVID-related infections, with patients getting these procedures. I'm gonna go one step further to everyone watching. COVID is rampant right now, we know that. It's running wild through the country. But the fact is COVID should not prevent, or the fear of getting COVID should not prevent you from getting your heart valve situation worked up. And the reason why I state that is what we've also seen in the last eight months, a number of patients who decided to wait on getting anything done because they were so scared of getting COVID that they ended up in the ER or worse, dying from their underlying valve condition because they did not go forward with getting it treated. We'd like to reassure everyone that the hospital, if any place in the city, is probably one of the cleanest places because of the disinfection rates that we are doing every day. But I will also state, if you have severe AS, severe mitral regurgitation, and you are having symptoms, I would absolutely want you to get seen by your physician and feel the need to get worked up further despite what's going on with COVID right now. Because the last thing I would want for any patient is to end up in the ER or worse because of a delay of therapy. All right, and this is gonna be our last question of the mm -hmm. evening. May TAVR be helpful in treating aneurysms in ascending aorta? So the question is, would TAVR be useful in treating ascending or dilated aortas? And the question is no, because TAVR is utilized for the aortic valve specifically. It does not treat aneurysms of the aorta or dilation of the aorta. Now, we have placed TAVR valves in patients who've had an aortic dilatation who had severe AS. And luckily, we've seen these patients do well without having further dilation of their aorta. However, this is a case-by-case basis, and there are certain levels of dilating aortas that I would tell a patient, if it's over five centimeters, you need to have surgery, not TAVR. And I want to thank everyone for coming this evening. A recording of tonight's lecture is available at bch.org slash live stream. You will receive a post-lecture survey by email tomorrow. And please take a minute to fill this out. And thank you again for joining us. And thank you, Dr. Iyengar. Thank you. thank you for having me. Thank you for watching, folks.